Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember, and this is our thoughts on Ruby, Volume 5, Episodes 3 and 4. Yes, they're volumes, not chapters. Oops. You would think five in, we would remember this. Yeah, and maybe the episodes are called chapters, which kind of makes sense, but eh. Okay, I finally understand more of the intro. <laughs> Thanks to Ozpin, because when we watched episode three and I saw the intro again, I was like, there's that point about God when they switch from that to that. So are they talking about what Salem's working for or what? Then we watched the episode and go, oh, Ozpin couldn't do something that the gods wanted him to do. And so he's been cursed to, until you fix this problem, you won't die. Well, you'll still die, but you have to keep coming back as you are. And you're going to become this amalgamation of souls until you learn enough to get it right. And we learn that Ruby sucks at hand-to-hand -hand combat, which kind of makes sense. She likes weapons way too much. Yes, so if she doesn't have a weapon to hand, her only advantage at that point is her speed and hoping she can dodge. But dodging without your weapon as opposed to holding crescent rows is totally different in terms of your balance. Especially with, you know, the weight of the weapon will shift with you as you're moving. You have to learn how to shift your own weight to get the same effect. Also, speed is kind of an advantage when you're fighting, not only to dodge, but to hit. Because the faster you are, the harder you can hit. But until she learns how to land those hits, her speed is better used for dodging. Which means she needs to focus more on the attacking and remembering to keep her defense up. And I like how you're like, is Oscar's eye color changing? I'm like, no, they've always been two shades, but they do light up now when they switch personalities. Yes, and that difference is probably going to become more and more subtle as they merge. Hmm. Because from what I understand, eye color is a very important thing in this universe. Not just silver eyes, but eye color overall. It kind of makes sense, especially with us talking about souls a lot. And eyes have always been the windows to the soul. So in this universe, they reflect your soul. Kind of like how Yang's eyes go from her normal color to red, which is her mother's eye color whenever she gets really ticked off. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting also, speaking of Yang, apparently she's learned more footwork from her father because she's using a lot more combinations of her feet and her fists. Instead of relying primarily on her arms, which was more of her previous style. Makes her a more balanced fighter. And once again, I'm pretty sure it's her nerves, but her hand was shaking again after the fight with the bandits. So I like that they're continuing to show that there are reactions to events that happen. You don't just get a band-aid and it's all better. Hmm. There's always repercussions. Also, I love that she went to Raven in order to get to Ruby. Because for a little bit, I thought that my prediction last season of, yeah, she's going after Ruby, was wrong because she was so obviously going after Raven in the previous episode. But now we learn that Raven's semblance is to always find a person she's tagged. And since she's tagged Crow, mm -hmm. Yang's like, yeah, you're going to take me to my uncle and then we're going to be done. Like, wait, you don't want to ask all the questions you wanted to ask years ago? No, I'm over that right now. I'd rather find my sister. You little brat. You come all this way, mess up my men, and then you want a favor. <laughs> We're family. It's one of the perks. <sighs> family. Only showing up when they want help. Really depends on the family. If they're estranged from each other, then yeah, usually that's what happens because they've been apart for so long that a lot of favors build up. Or one big one happens and then, hey, we're family. Can you help me out with this? Now, if you stayed around more often, things wouldn't build up, and you wouldn't have them asking for favors all the time. Or maybe they did, and that's why you're estranged. Eh. Can't happen. Mm -hmm. Some families are just weird that way. And then there's other families where you're like, they're a family? Why aren't they fighting? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we fight all the time, they're just little fights. That is a neat parlor trick. The whole switching between souls. Though apparently eventually that's not going to happen because they're going to be one soul at one point, which is kind of a bummer for Oscar. Mm -hmm. But it makes sense when you look back at the previous season and the conversations between Oscar and Osben. You know, you don't have a choice. I am sorry about this because all the memories will be retained. So Oscar's memories will become part of the chain of Osben back through however many incarnations, but he will no longer be a separate self and you know that's just a little cruel of the gods to 
pull in other innocent people because Osmond's original incarnation couldn't do his job. Well, that once again brings up the question of, is Ozpin the old guy from the story? Yes, because now we've definitely ruled out that Ozpin is not a maiden, but he could still be the magician. And is Salem one of the originals, or was she just something that popped up during the original maidens? Kind of interesting, really. Because all we've heard of the backstory of the world is legend. And legend takes a kernel of fact and expands on that. So we know Salem isn't a maiden currently because they're searching for all the maidens. But if she was somehow at one point a maiden and the power passed from her without her dying, or if she, like Ozpin, has managed to reincarnate with memory intact. And is it a without choice reincarnation or is it a choice reincarnation compared to Ozpin, where she chooses her next vessel, which might be why she's working so hard on Cinder. Kind of interesting. Though I have a feeling if it is something like that, we won't see it in this volume. No. Also, I think I was incorrect on the number of episodes. There may be 14 this season. Mm. Well, we'll see when we get there. Because I always do research to make sure about things. I also was checking, like, what do we call these seasons? Oh, volumes. Oh, and there's supposed to be 14, not 13 I remember reading about. Hmm. So, any favorite points in these two episodes? Oh, I love how my entire thing of how Weiss was going to be in the camp for a long time and, you know, win the maiden over to their side just totally got blown out of the water. Also, that maiden will be surprised if she ever runs into Nora. Because she used a lightning bolt there. Also, I love how Nora found out about her semblance. I got struck by lightning one day. I didn't die. It was a Tuesday. I thought it was a crazy Thursday. <laughs> ah, she said it so fast then. Mm -hmm. It makes sense for it to be a crazy Thursday for her. And also it was nice for anyone who is still speculating on what Lee Rin's semblance is, for them to state it in plain English that it's to mask emotions. Mm, I missed that. I heard them talking about it and how he got it, but I didn't hear that it was to mask emotions. But yes. that's good, was what we theorized it was. Yes, because with all the color being drawn away, and that's why the Grim can't see you, because there's no emotion for them to track you by. And speaking of that, I love how well Raven runs her camp. Everyone settle down, you're going to bring Grim down on us. Yes, ma'am. And I'm not quite sure about Raven yet, whether I like her or dislike her, or... She's in that middle point where she's getting development. We'll see where this goes. Yes, because right now it could really go either way, because when she first showed up, not really thrilled with her. When she was talking with Crow, not really thrilled with her. The interaction between her and Yang in the camp felt very real. I love how, you don't disrespect our leader! Make me. <laughs> <laughs> and I love how Wise was like, well, everyone knows about this now. Like, oh, well, so much for secrecy. Okay, just bust me out of here. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> what is that? Don't worry about that now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's work on what we have here. <laughs> and once again, the pacing is superb. These two episodes flowed so well. And they hit all the right notes for me to go, dang, I hate windowing. Because <laughs> I'm like, I want to watch more. <laughs> yes, but at least Rooster Teeth does reasonable paywalls. It's very reasonable. And I, what is it, like three ninety nine a month? I believe there's two tiers, depending on how long you sign up for. Because I think if you sign up for an extended period, you get a lower monthly rate because you're providing them more cash at once. But I'm glad it's more of a windowing situation than a complete paywall. And apparently windowing is a big thing now. It pulls in more revenue that way than complete paywalls, which kind of makes sense. Yeah, because... Paywalls are basically a do not cross sign. Though windowing doesn't really work for certain types of media, like any kind of news reporting or anything like that. Anything that's really time sensitive can't really be delayed. So did you have any nitpicks for these? Um, we still have only touched on two sections of the story. We need to uh, go back to the island. We haven't talked about that at all. Oh, and the whole thing... With Blake's father and Blake and how Sun used his ability 
or something because I didn't see him move from behind the stage to where he was sneaking to catch her. I could have sworn I saw him move. Hmm. Plus his ability creates kind of a glowing duplicate, not a full duplicate like Blake's. No, he was more of just using his agility. And her being so dramatic as a great way to keep herself distracted while he sneaks. The only thing was he shouldn't have done shut up. He should have just tackled her. Give no warning. This is always why you go, hmm, that guy's taking time to shut out the name of his attack. Wow. Is this Jackie Chan Adventures? Because <laughs> if it is, I understand. And if not, this just gives me an opportunity to attack. Or dodge. Because now I know what's coming. Even if you shut the name of an attack, I can just dodge completely out of the way. Because I don't have to care what that attack is. I just know it's coming. I also love how everyone was just then, get her! <laughs> Couldn't you have done that sooner? Before Sun tried to grab her? But everyone was listening to her because she was making a great counterpoint to what the Belladonnas were saying. Because everyone was listening to the Belladonnas until he said, we need to go help the humans. And then they're all like, what? And then she comes in with, really? This is what you want us to do. And spouts off all these reasons of why we shouldn't. Yeah, but here's the thing. You should. Because it will benefit both of you. He said that repeatedly throughout his announcement. It will benefit both of us if humans and us are equal. It will benefit both of us. It will benefit both of us. It will benefit both of us. You want that. Yes, but there's still that problem of in order to be equal, we have to actually be better. Because, hmm, we all need to go bail out the humans and prove that we're better in order to be treated as equals. Yeah, but that's because you're currently treating yourselves as either someone extremely better than them, or you're showing that you're what the humans think you are. If you can show that you're different than what they think you are, you show that you can be treated as an equal. Yes, that really the only differences are in your abilities. Yeah, it takes a long time to get rid of prejudice. It takes generations, in fact. It does, because even a new generation can be have a trickle down of the previous generation's ideals. And things take a lot of time. And the Belladonnas were saying that. But, you know, so many people are tired of how long things have taken. Yeah, but that's the thing. You have to understand that it takes time. It doesn't hurt to have the urge and stamina and wherewithal to be like, yeah, we got to do something about this. That's good. You want that. But you have to understand that it won't move instantly. Very few things change overnight, except usually in instances of tragedy. Mm -hmm. And even then, that's just a starting point. It's not the finisher. It's a starting point. It's a spark that gets things going. But that's the thing, is those tragedies can be the spark. And that's where Adam is going with his violence. Is His violence is the spark to move things the way he wants them to be. It was interesting how calm his little disciples were there in the audience. Though I don't think anyone on this island right now knows about what's happened. No, I don't think any of them know that the High Leader is dead. And like you said, it's probably going to be really interesting... When that lady finds out. Yeah, when Ilea finds out, oh my goodness. And it's going to be really difficult because we see in the title sequence her and Blake clashing. And neither of them really want to. But the sides that they've chosen are forcing that interaction. And Ilea is really having to deal a lot with her morals and how she wants to stay the course. Because we see that image of her standing in front of a portrait that's lit by candles, which is often used to memorialize someone. And that image is in the shadow. So as I said last time, I think it's High Leader. To me right now, I kept looking at it. It looks like a cloaked figure of some sort. But that's the thing. It's a cloaked figure. That doesn't mean it can't be the High Leader. I'm just saying that like right now, I'm only seeing a cloaked figure. So we'll figure it out. Well, eventually they may actually show us the portrait in more detail. Mm, in the actual episodes, yeah. Because things are hinted at in the title sequence. I also noticed that, watching the title sequence again and really thinking about it, that when the song says Triumph, it's actually focusing on 
the big bad Salem and her going, yes, but then it switches, we'll be ours, to the main four. Yes, at the final word of the song, which declares which side is the victor, it shows Team Ruby. But there's so much going on in that intro with the lyrics and placement of the lyrics with the action. I'm like, yes, every time we watch this intro, we will come up with another piece. Because the further along we get, the more we're able to pair it with what's shown in the episodes. And the more we can extrapolate into the future. Because they've been known to put stuff in the intro that doesn't even deal with that season. It's the thing that they're doing in the future. Because they have this series planned out for quite a ways. Because I was just remembering stuff from Volume 1 going, Oh yeah, that! <laughs> I can't remember what in this episode, but there were several instances where I was like, Oh yeah! Yeah, we talked about that, and we showed that, and we referenced that. That's cool. We're all building in continuity. Yes, I have a little trouble recalling the season one opener because I watched volume one as a stitched together version, so I really only saw the introduction once or twice. Anything else we should go over? <laughs> well, since we were talking about how things were going on the island, it also ties back into how... Blake and Sun look like they're stuck there because it's stalemate with getting the people motivated to leave the island to take the next action. Mm. And then going back to the raider camp, why would Weiss believe the maiden that Winter wouldn't come help her? Because that would be a very convenient thing to lie about. Also, I would have played the card of, you really think my father's going to pay for me? That would have been my card. Though I think the father would want to pay for her. The card I would have played is like, you think I want to go back? There's that card too. I was expecting either the, you think he's going to pay for me, or I just spent how much time getting away from there? You really want to send me back? Because I got the impression that the father wanted her back, but he wants her locked away in such a way. He wants her under control so that she can be withdrawn for a mysterious illness and hand over her inheritance to that little brat. <laughs> yeah, we don't know that other term. Is he? Isn't he? How much does it matter? Because, you know, it's implied. Weiss goes, are you jealous of my power? And we know from winter, like two seasons ago, that all Schnees inherit the same semblance power. But he does refer to Weiss's mother as mother. So, very complicated there. I'm glad the episodes are hovering around the 15-20 minute mark. What's really funny is they still feel like the 5-10 minute shorts that the first volume was. Because of the pacing so good that, like, wow, we're already through that episode? Yeah, they really have pacing nailed. Like, whatever that arc is for timing, I think they've tapped into it. Yeah, I think they studied that because a lot of the criticism I remember hearing was how weird the pacing was for last volume. This one, they are really getting that pacing. It's very satisfying to watch. And for reference, we're referring to a particular curve that I learned about through a show on YouTube called Extra Credit. So if you look up Extra Credit and you see a primarily green thumbnail with drawn stick figures, that's the channel. And it's very interesting to look at because it really taps into the brain's primal impulses that hitting specific marks on that arc predispose you to liking something. Like, I mean, think about how basic the story is in the original Star Wars movie, the first one. That is a good example of something that uses that curve because the story is really basic. It's a classic tale, but the way it's put together and the pacing on it nails this curve. So you really like it because it's satisfying to watch. So anything that really bugged you or a nitpick? <laughs> uh, not too much bugged or nitpick. A little bit of the, wait a minute, we still have to train? But we just did all this stuff last season. Like, yes, but you still have weaknesses. It's really interesting for that too because Ospin says, yeah, eventually his body will get the muscle memory I have, and how fast he's picking things up, but he's still, because of the intense training, I am so exhausted, especially when Ozpin, like, turns the switch and it's back to poor Oscar. Well, that's the thing. Even if you're getting the muscle memory, because you can inherit the memory through the system, but that's not going to change the muscle volume. 
tone, cardiovascular system. All of that still has to be trained up naturally. So even though the body will recognize how to move correctly more quickly than an average person training, that's not going to help build up the muscles or the stamina or the ability to direct aura. I also love how Ruby drew Oscar and Jean together and went, see, you're alike in this. You're still both discovering. You haven't learned what it is yet. You know, when they get in the whole semblance thing and John's starting to get down about it. And I like how Ren talks about the philosophy behind it, too. How it may be linked to your personality. It may be what drives your personality. It may be something completely different. No one has a solid philosophy on it. Yes, that there's several different schools of thought. And that there are different avenues to explore. It's like, I've done all this training and I still haven't figured it out yet. Well, I think you have you have it, but you just haven't quite tapped into it yet. It's going to be interesting. It's probably going to pop out at a pivotal moment. Or it's going to be hinted at in a non-pivotal moment. And then we'll actually see it execute. Because it could be a completely passive thing. Like Ren's, because Ren's is quite passive, if you think about it. Yeah, it's basically a cloaking device against Grimm. Just, wow. And I like the way they illustrate it when it activates. Color goes away. Because that may just be it. Like, to the Grimm, it's a bright, colorful world. Which is kind of funny for Grimm. And then they just blend into the background of noise. <laughs> or it could be like the, they see the entire world in grays, except for people when they lit up with emotion. So by them turning gray, they now blend into the background of nothing. Entirely possible. Because we don't know how Grimm actually view things. We know what they sense, but we don't know how they sense or see it. Kind of like when you're facing a predator and they are primarily using their heat vision and Arnold Schwarzenegger cut it himself in mud so he blended into the cold background. Or that moment in Gravity Falls where, oh yeah, these bots pick up on fear, so as long as you're calm. Hmm, that's another great example. Even closer to what we're actually dealing with. Yes, because that specifically focused on emotion. Uh, so, what are your final thoughts on these two episodes? Very good, very enjoyable. Uh, based on the way we're talking, I think that the arcs for Yang, Wise, and Ruby are kind of overpowering what happened with Blake, at least in this episode. Because in the previous episode, Blake's section seemed more intense because we had the whole thing with Adam Taurus and the High Leader and Hazel, where this time, even though the island's got a big segment, and that was very important. Apparently it didn't hold us quite the same as the other sections. Mm -hmm. Well, you get the fighting with Ye and Wise with her, I have an awesome power now, ask me questions about it later. I liked how we, Weiss was going all for secrecy until, oh, cover's blown, may as well. And also that fun moment of, Yang? Weiss? You kidnapped her? <laughs> I love that, like, the whole con was like, Hug. <laughs> Come on in, I'll tell you the truth, or at least my perception of what the truth actually is. Yeah, so that you kids can know what you're getting into, because if you guys continue this fight sequence, you're going to bring Grim down on my camp. And I'd rather not have that happen, because I got a good thing set up here. What would be really funny if they already sent the note off to her father? That would be hilarious. And the father comes in to get wise, and she's gone now. We gotta let her go, because... She kind of tore apart of our camp. Also, apparently she's friends with our leader's daughter. So yeah, kind of got that going on. Yeah, because Raven even ordered the maiden to give Weiss her sword back. It was like, okay, they're standing there ready to tear you guys up, and you just handed her a weapon? Act of faith right there. Now that we go over that scene again, I'm starting to lean a little bit towards, I like her. <laughs> Because I think she's just a smart woman who didn't like what she ended up dealing with because it was too big for her, as she phrased it. Too big for all of us. Who knows? Because, as Crow said in the World of Remnant videos, we'll have to see where the next generation takes us. So as she said, I really enjoyed the episodes. Interesting things are going on. Can't wait for the next ones. I've got so many theories that I want to prove right. And none of them have to deal with shipping. Yeah, yeah, that last hug probably caused a shipping explosion. More like reinforced, because they have been shipping those four, like, for ages, ever since the start. The main pairings are usually Weiss and Ruby, Blake and Yang, but lately I've seen a lot of, like, all of them. 
They're, they're in a group. They're, they're all together. <laughs> Just, yeah. Like, well, I like my main pairing, but I want the others in, too. That's more like, well, I've written everything that I can come up with that only involves two people. Let's see what happens with four! Also, I can't believe I'm saying this. As this channel goes on, apparently I'm more willing to talk about shipping, even though I don't really ship. Well, it's still a fascinating thing from the outside. Well, it's also a fascinating thing from the inside, I'm sure. It's just a different perspective. Because it's not that I'm canon only, but if you think about the song a little bit, you're on the canon ground, I'm up in crack ship space. I'm closer to the canon ground. But, you know, if you write an engaging story, then, you know, I might be engaged. I'm perfectly fine to look into crack ship space and go, wow, I would have never put those two together. Well, you wrote them well. <laughs> ah, outro. Mm -hmm. And this has been our thoughts on Ruby, volume five, episodes three and four. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, please like, comment, subscribe, share, check out other videos, rewatch this one, nitpick it, tell us all the things we got right, got wrong. We enjoy comments like that. Just try not to be too attacky. If you enjoy Lux's art, you can find more of it on DeviantArt, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, a couple Mastodon servers, and Reddit if he remembers, and any other section of cyberspace that we might find in the meantime. Really enjoy Lux's art style and would like some artwork of your own? Check the link below for commission pricing and availability. Commission's out of budget, but you'd still like to help us? Check out Patreon, where at the $1 stage, you get a monthly sketch and get to help vote on others. Don't want to deal with possibly recurring charges? Check out Coffee, which is a one-time charge and is available in $3 increments. Thank you again for listening.